Uh, for those of you who are joining us on video, we're, this is our Calibrate lesson. We just uh, talked to some of the students about what they need to do to uh, get the credit for this class. But anyway, uh, in it I talked about how one of the things you're going to read is from Jerry Paul, and um, some of my stuff on prayer here that I'm going to share in this lecture is heavily influenced from material that I stole, ripped off unashamedly from Jerry Paul. So if you, uh, if you listen to this lecture and you hear something, hey, I heard Jerry Paul say that. Yeah, that's right. He said it first. I'm, I'm ripping him off. He didn't rip me off. So, uh, But uh, some of the stuff later that we talk about fasting and, and especially on biblical meditation, that's more the fruit of my own labor. So uh, I hope that all of it is a blessing to you as it has been to me to study God's Word and to, and, and really we're all stealing it all from the Holy Spirit. So anyway, so uh, <laughs> um, I, I hope that this material is helpful to you and an encouragement to you uh, as we talk about uh, our, our life and our personal spiritual uh, life. Um, one of the real um, barometers of a person's spiritual health is their, their prayer life, the fasting, uh, the Bible study, that kind of thing it is a real a barometer of where the guy is in his walk and his relationship with God. Uh, a man or a woman who are constantly in prayer, uh, constantly seeking the Lord, um, constantly meditating upon His Word, they're going to go quickly uh, to a whole different level in their walk with God, uh, in the blessings of their life, um, in their attitude. And really, um, I, I called the class Calibrate because uh, by looking at our prayer life, looking at our, our fasting life, looking at our Bible meditation life, uh, we are going to be able to not only measure how we're doing spiritually, but we're going to be able to realign it and calibrate it to, to where it needs to be. Um, in this world, there's all kinds of temptations. There's all kinds of forces and uh, baggage that we carry and problems we've had and hurts that we've faced and temptations that we struggle with and insecurities we have and uh, the scars of sins that we bear from our past or that others have done to us. And all of that can knock us off kilter so that the, 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 uh, the, the wheels of our life are unaligned. And we need to recalibrate everything sometimes so that we're, we're running straight. And I'm telling you, nothing will recalibrate your life like developing a, a prayer life, uh, um, a, a fasting, uh, you know, understanding of fasting and what it does, and, and an understanding of uh, what it means to meditate biblically, not transcendental meditation or eastern meditation but true what the bible talks about when it talks about and it talks about it a lot even though we don't meditation and so i really feel like uh this is an important lesson not just because well christians ought to know about prayer christians ought to know about fasting or christians ought to know about biblical meditation but because as far as personal benefit it really helps you one of the things I do when I talk about priorities, and I go around the country teaching uh, personal evangelism, but the, ironically, the first thing I do in the personal evangelism thing is I teach on priorities. And one of the things I talk about is how God needs to be first. You know, we need to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second greatest command is to love your neighbors yourself. And a lot of people think, well, then first priority is love God, and second priority is love others. But it isn't really, if you look at it, you love others as you love yourself. And you need to have a love for yourself before you can love others. And until you realize the love of God, you're not going to be able to love yourself, and you're not going to be able to love anyone else. And you can't love your neighbors yourself if you treat yourself terrible. And how can you love your neighbor, your children, your husband, your wife, your, your strangers, uh, your fellow Christians, whoever, how can you love people properly and love them as you love yourself if you don't love yourself? So if you're not taking care of your relationship with God, how can you be a blessing to anybody else in their relationship to God? And the illustration I always give is when I get on an airplane, I go fly, they always give up and give the little safety talk that everybody ignores, you know, beforehand. And, and one of the things she says, uh, you know, and it it's always creeps me out when they say this, in the unlikely event that we lose cabin pressure, what? You know, let's not talk about that before we take off. In the unlikely event we lose cabin pressure, this little mask will fall down. And it tells you, what do you do with the mask first? What's the first thing you do? 
put it on yourself. Well, you don't put it on your kid first. Because if you pass out and run out of oxygen, you can't help your kid put one on. So before you can take the speck out of your neighbor's eye, you've got to get the plank out of your own. And before we can help other people become Christians, we have to make sure we're right with God. And before we can help our spouse, our family, our children, our grandchildren, um, our parents, our, our, our neighbors, our coworkers, to grow in their relationship with God, we've got to have one. We've got to have a vibrant one. And before we can be the kind of people we need to be and model love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control that we get from the Holy Spirit dwelling in us richly, we have to keep in step with the Spirit. We have to walk with God, like Enoch, like Noah. We've got to walk with God. And we can't do that if we don't pray and talk to Him. If we don't fast and seek Him. If we don't uh, meditate upon Him his actions, his creation, and his word. We can't have this uh, benefit to others or be who we're even made to be if we're not in a walk with Christ himself. Jesus didn't say, you know, come and study about me and I'll make you fishers of men. He said, come follow me. He is not inviting us into a student relationship. He's inviting us into a father-son, a husband-wife, uh, uh, a, a, an intimate family kind of relationship. And so we need to develop these things that are going to mold us and shape us into who we need to be for God and for others to, to live right. And like I said, that's why uh, your prayer life and your fasting, your meditation, all of that is an indication of your spiritual health and how you're going to be able to, to walk with others. Now, uh, how many of you are in ministry in here? You are actually in ministry, so several of you. Okay, so all the more with you, you're supposed to be leaders. You're supposed to be guiding people in, in their walk with God. That is going to be impossible for you to do. But what did Jesus say? The blind lead the blind, and they both end up in the ditch. And until you become the Christian God has called you to be, you'll never be able to lead others to be the Christians they're supposed to be. Okay? So we need to make sure that we're calibrated. And it's not something you do once. You know, you don't go out here and get on the interstate, put your hands, okay, I'm going in the right direction, and go, you know, <laughs> you can't stop looking. It's constant micro adjustments as you drive. You have to constantly be in this state of calibrating where that vehicle is going and constantly adjusting to the varying you know, uh, conditions around you. And the same is true in your spiritual walk. You can't go, well, I prayed a prayer and now I'm good. I fasted once and now I'm set. Well, I read the Bible one time and now I know it. It doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that any more than, well, I ate one meal, now I don't ever have to eat again. Uh, you know, I took a bath once, <laughs> you know, uh, that doesn't work that way. Uh, you know, I told my wife I loved her when we got married. Why do I need to do it again? You know, there's some things that need to be repeated. And, uh, and we need to be in this constant state of calibration. And so the first of the topics we're going to talk about is prayer. And I want you to look at Luke 11. 1. One day Jesus was praying in a certain place. And when he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. So what's one of the things we know that the apostle, not the apostle, but the, uh, the prophet John, John the Baptist, taught his disciples? He taught them how to pray. Evidently, that's something that we should be teaching. And so that's why I'm teaching it to you. That's why I hope you take this information that I've uh, ripped off from others and, and go share it with them. Okay, I hope that you will share this information because people need to be taught how to pray. Now notice, what was the cue to make his disciples want to learn how to pray? They saw him praying. Prayer is inspired when it is modeled. Prayer is inspired when it's modeled. Okay, so I know that a lot of you knew my dad. And some of you real well to know that what I'm saying is true. Some of you maybe not. But I'll tell you one thing about George Fall. Uh, he walked what he talked. Now, he wasn't perfect, and he was very human. Uh, um, 
But he lived out what he talked about. So when I'm 14, uh, I'd been living with my mom. I'm 14, I move in with my dad. And, um, you know, I'd already spent a lot of time with him in the summers and on the weekends from, from the age of 10 to 15. I guess I was fif- 14, about to turn 15 when I, I moved in. I was a freshman in high school. I, I think I turned 15 a month after I moved in with him. And I would be out with my friend John in high school or whatever, you know, and I would come home and I would find dad one of three ways. He would either be at his desk with his head like this, big old King James that he'd been using for, well, since 1611, I think, Uh, um, and a yellow legal pad, legal pad, yellow legal pad, with chicken scratching on it, and it, his secretary, as I feel from it, took a degree just to learn to interpret that stuff. And, uh, and, he'd be, he'd be, and he'd be like this, he'd be like this, like this, and he's right, you know. He's coming up with some 12-point alliterative outline, right? So, uh, or, if he wasn't like that, he was like this. Feet up on the desk, lean back, I guess, and Bible on his <laughs> He fell asleep reading that thing. Third distinct possibility, and this often happened, he'd already be in bed. Because, you know, I'm a teenager. I'm getting home from hanging out with my friends on the weekend. It's late. I go in and say, hey, Dad, I'm home. Hold on a second. I'm praying. And it was his regular practice to pray till he fell asleep. Like, he wouldn't pray and then go to sleep. Like, and he says, some people think that's disrespectful. He says, I think it's just, uh, I feel close to God. He would sit there and pray until he just fell asleep praying. And I know, though, well, he didn't say the magic words in Jesus' name, amen. Is it heard? Now, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> he <laughs> doesn't work like that. Um, so, yeah, he would pray. R- r- like, I would catch my dad regularly studying God's word regularly praying. Now, I wouldn't catch him fasting as much because he'd always keep fasting to himself. He wouldn't lay by like Jesus taught. You know, brag about fasting. So sometimes I'd find out, I'm like, Dad, why aren't you eating? Well, I'm fasting. But only if I asked. But I would catch my dad doing it. You know, involved regularly, daily. In God's Word, praying. And, you know, he prayed about more than anybody I know and then he would always say, oh, I just don't pray enough. I need to be a better prayer. I, he, was always, he was always concerned he wasn't praying. And uh, he just got to where, um, I remember we'd be going down the highway. <laughs> you know, I'm, he's taking me home on a Sunday night. And there was a, uh, a woman on the street corner in downtown Fort Wayne when he was taking me back to my mom's house. And she'd be immodestly dressed, standing on a street corner, working. And he'd be like, well, there's a deep ditch. He'd start quoting Proverbs about the immoral woman, you know, and, these, and then he'd start praying for her. God be with her. Lead her out of that life. Send somebody to her. We'd be driving along down the road. It's the middle of the day. There's a guy. He's handicapped. He's like having a hard time walking. He's got like one leg. He's on crutches. God be with that man. Be with him and meet his needs. You know, he would randomly pray for strangers in front of me. And prayer was just he never said, okay, son, come here. Now we're going to pray. He didn't force anything on me. Now, we would pray before meals and stuff like that regularly. That was a habit. But he never said, okay, Kendall, you've got to... He just modeled it first and showed me about prayer and then taught me the doctrines and the teaching on prayer. And then I just became a prayer. But he set the example. And we have to create a hunger in people for a walk with God. And the way you do that is by walking with Him. You don't do it by like, all right, kids, now you've got to have devotions. And you don't pray yourself and you don't do anything yourself and you're forcing your kids into something to do something that you don't even do on your own. You want to inspire your, ki- your, your, your followers to be prayers, be a prayer. And they'll come to you and say, teach me to do that. How do I do that? How can I have what you have? And teaching our kids to pray is a huge priority. Do you know that most scholars believe that the book of Job was written before the book of Genesis? 
Now, of course, Genesis deals with things that happened long before Job, because according to Jewish tradition um, and Josephus, Job was a contemporary uh, of Jacob. In fact, according to Josephus, Job's wife was uh, Jacob's, one of Jacob's uh, um, daughters. And uh, I don't know if that's true, but uh, the, that's what Josephus said. In fact, it was the really beautiful daughter that had been raped and that her brothers had killed the men of that town who raped her. Uh, that very beautiful woman was who uh, Job married, according to Josephus. But anyway, <clears throat> um, Job was a guy who prayed. And he prayed for his children. And he prayed every day. Now, under the, patri- under the Mosaic law, the priests were the ones who offered sacrifices and prayers and interceded between the people of Israel and God. And now, Jesus is our high priest today, and he intercedes for us. But back in the patriarchal period, before Christianity, before the Mosaic Law, in that first period of time, under the patriarchal system, the oldest living male of the family would offer sacrifices and be the priest for the family. And so, Job was playing that role for his children. And look what it says here in this, perhaps, the oldest piece of scripture we have. Uh, Job 1, 1 through 5. In the land of Uz, there lived a man named Job. The man was blameless and upright. He feared God, shunned evil. He had seven sons and three daughters, and he owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 5,000 yoke of oxen, 500 donkeys, and had a large number of servants. He was the greatest man among all the people of the East. His sons used to take turns holding feasts in their homes, and they would invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. And when the period of fasting had run its course, Job would send them and have them purified. Early in the morning, he would sacrifice a burnt offering for each of them, thinking, perhaps my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. This was Job's regular custom. The man was fasting, praying, offering sacrifices and prayers to atone for his children because he cared about his children's walk with God. He was this man of devotion and faith in God, just this upright exceptional man who God had blessed, but notice what the Bible says his number one concern was. It was for his children. I do a a parenting class, and I I teach the same thing in my parenting class, because look at the concern, the primary concern of this man, you know. It wasn't his wealth and all his companies or his 401k or all. He was concerned with, my children, are are they right with God? And so notice his devoutness. Early in the morning, he would get up, he would offer burnt sacrifices. He would have uh, periods of, uh, uh, where he would just pray, God, if my kids have sinned or cursed you in any way, forgive them. As their priest, he was making atonement for them and interceding for them. That was the prayer life of Job. He had this priority of prayer in his life for his children. And look what it says, Job 1, 17 to 20. While he's still speaking, yet another messenger came and said, your sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house when suddenly a mighty wind swept in from the desert, struck the four corners of the house, and it collapsed on them, and they're dead. And I'm, I'm the only one who escaped to tell you. At this, Job got up, tore his robe, shaved his head, and fell on the ground and worshiped and said... Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. And all this Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. Can you imagine what he could say? God, I got up, and I prayed for my kids every day. And I offered sacrifices. And I prayed for them. And this is how you treat me. A tornado comes along and kills all my kids. Took me all, all my kids away from me, all ten of them. What's the use of praying if this is how God answers your prayers? Uh, by the Bible's term, an upright, godly man who cared for his children and prayed for them, and they all die. How is that right? I had a guy write me about this. I had a blog for a while back. 
the early 2000s when blogs were the cool thing. And, uh, and I had r- written on something about God, and he was an atheist. And he read the Bible, and he said, Job didn't sin. Was it right for him to fear the bloodthirsty God of the Bible? God allowed Satan to kill his children, destroy all his property, and make him sick and miserable. God may decide to do that to you too, whether or not you sin. Not quite the loving father image you tried to portray, is it? I'm sure that your father, being a kind and caring person, would never let a madman kill your children to test you as God did Job. I love how the devil causes problems and then blames it on God. So that's what Jimmy wrote. How do you answer Jimmy? He prayed for his kids every day, was concerned for them, prayed for them every day, and they all died. Does Jimmy have a point? So then the long discussion happens and uh, Job's pathetic friends come and uh, harass him and tell him it's all his fault and blame him and, uh, and tell him how evil he must be and all this kind of stuff. And so Job goes through all this, and at the end, Job just wants to know why. You know? He's not even accusing God of wrongdoing. He just, he just wants to know why. And God... <laughs> Ask, who's this that obscures my counsel without knowledge? Uh, surely I spoke of things I didn't understand, things too wonderful for me to know. Job says, God, why? And God asks Job a series of 40 questions that he cannot answer. Most of them scientific questions that science today still cannot answer. And I remember uh, I had a professor who talked about how he was driving to Cincinnati Bible College one day, and he was, as he turned the corner to, to, onto Layman Drive to go up to the school, he went up and over the hill comes up the sun, and it hits him, and it's so bright, he can't see. He can't look into it. No sunglasses. He had to put the visor down, and he still hardly could see, and he had to kind of come up over the hill and let his car even out a little bit before he could see to where he was going when he was driving. And he thought to himself, I can't even look at the sun that God created much less look at God and question Him. I can't even look into the sun He made, much less look, look at Him and understand. My eyes aren't made to see that. The Bible says that if you, if you saw God the Father, you were in His presence, you'd die. There's some things that are too wonderful for us to know. So, he wanted to know why, and God doesn't ever tell him. God says, well, I'll tell you why when you can answer these questions. He couldn't answer the questions. <laughs> and so when he's saying, he's like, I, I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. The question of, why would God allow Job's children to die? Mm, mm. I could tell you, but you wouldn't understand. The Jimmies of this world act like they know what's best. No, my dad uh, never went and allowed my children to be killed, as Jimmy asked. But my dad did uh, spank me. My dad did discipline me and punish me, and he punished my kids when they came to visit his house. Uh, if they were staying with Grandpa and they were, I wasn't around, they acted up. Why? Well, he did what Grandpas do. Um, he gave me shots that I didn't want to get. He forced me to eat food I didn't want to eat. He forced me to go to school when I didn't want to go. He forced me to go to church sometimes when I didn't want to. And he, he forced me to wear suits I did not want to wear and ties I did not want to wear. He forced me to do all kinds of stuff I didn't want to do. I remember one time... I said, uh, I don't want to go to church tonight. It was Sunday night. He goes, why not? And I go, it's not any fun. He, he's like, who told you that going to church was supposed to be fun? <laughs> we don't go to church for fun. <laughs> I'll never forget that. Uh, he made me do stuff I didn't want to do. 
cause me pain sometimes. Um, when I cut my hand open, he took me to a doctor and had him put needles through my skin or my forehead or my leg. The times I got, I was always getting cut open. Uh, he had painful things happen to me for my own well-being. Why did Job have to go through this? Why did his children have to die? Why did he have to lose all his wealth? God says, you can't even understand my creation or handle my creation. How are you going to understand all the reasons I have for allowing what I allow? We don't pray because we want everything to be perfect here on earth. This place is cursed. God cursed the ground. All creation is cursed. And you want him to remove the curse now before he comes back, and that's not going to happen. He's going to remove the curse when this heaven and earth pass away and he creates a new heaven and new earth that aren't cursed. You want a world with no problems? You're not going to find it here. In fact, if you follow Jesus, you're going to find new problems. Because Satan's going to come after you like he did Job. Notice his eternal focus. I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the end he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, and yet in my flesh I will see God. I myself will see him, my own eyes, and not another. Oh, how my heart yearns within me. Why were Job's prayers answered? Because he wasn't praying that his kids would live forever on earth. He wasn't praying that his kids would get a good education and a good spouse and uh, a nice house and they would live 70 years and then die. He wasn't praying that uh, his kids would uh, you know, have everything they ever wanted here on earth. He wasn't praying that they would be rich like him. He was praying that if they sinned, God would forgive them. Because his focus was on the eternal. If you pray and your kids find a good spouse and a good education and a good job and a good life here and they live uh, 80 years, 90 years, and then they die not knowing Jesus, they go to hell for eternity. And what was all that worth? He wasn't praying that they would never see a tornado. He was praying that their sins would be forgiven. And his prayer was answered. He was praying for spiritual things and for eternal things. Not for temporary things alone. And you know what? If his kids hadn't died in that tornado that terrible day, you know when they would have died? A few years later. Maybe after him, but they would have died. Your kids aren't going to live forever. Your spouse isn't going to live forever, and neither are you. Unless you go to heaven. And you're resurrected on the last day. You're not going to live forever. You're going to go to hell. He was praying about their spiritual condition. He was, and his prayer was answered. His focus was eternal. You sit around and pray, Oh, God, don't let my kid get sick. Don't let my kid... Well, yeah, there's nothing wrong with praying for physical health or for a spouse or for a good job. Nothing wrong with praying for those things. But don't live under the delusion that your kid's going to go through life and never have their heart broken and that they're not going to die someday if Jesus doesn't come back first. They're going to get sick and die or die in an accident. That's just a fact. My little Mac, he's, he'll be two years old next month. Someday he'll die. If Jesus doesn't come back first. And someday Madison and Drake and Kaylee and David and Daniel and Annie, my wife, they'll all die. I'm going to die. You think the only way that God's good and loving is if he answers the, your prayer for you get every little thing you want here and now? Is that what you're focused on? Is that what the Bible promises? Is that what the Bible talks about? Is that the hope of Christianity that, that uh, what the false money grubbing preachers on tv say have your best life now look if you get your best life now that's sad because hell's coming i want my best life for eternity not here on this cursed planet and when it comes to prayer make your prayer about eternal things first go to a lot of churches 
see a lot of bulletins. All over the country I travel. And I see a lot of prayer lists. A lot of prayer requests. And it's mostly for the health concerns of the members, their families, and their cousins, brothers, sisters, uncles, college roommate. Not a lot of spiritual things in there. Not a lot of prayers for, uh, I don't know, something like, uh, Lord, raise up workers for the harvest. Because the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Not a lot of prayers for, Lord, open up some opportunities for us to share the gospel this week. Or, uh, Lord, forgive these people who've done us wrong. Or, uh, God, give us boldness and courage to go out and share the gospel with people even though we're afraid. When we compare the prayer requests of the apostles and the prayer life of the apostles to ourselves, what do we find? When we compare our prayer life to Job, what do we find? Let me ask you a question. If all your kids died in a tornado tomorrow, what would your prayer be? Would you be mad at God? Would you hold it against Him, say, you didn't answer my prayers? Or were your prayers for your kids' eternal state or your prayers just for your kids' temporary blessings that they aren't going to keep. If God gives your kids a good spouse, they aren't keeping them. If God gives your kids lots of kids, you get grandkids, you're not keeping them. If they get a good job, they're not keeping it. If they get a nice house, they're not keeping it. Nice car, they're not keeping it. Get money, they're not keeping that. The government's still there. The banks are still falling apart. Don't, don't even look at money. It's like a bird, it'll fly away. Pray for eternal things. Get your priorities in prayer straight. There's some things we should be praying for. But is it what we're praying for? As we start our lesson, we ask, is there eternal focus? Look at 1 Peter. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Be self-controlled. Set your hope fully on the grace to be given to you when Jesus Christ is revealed. I love this verse, and whenever I preach on this verse, I, I often, I'll pull out two chairs. I can't do it here because all the chairs here are on wheels, it'd get awkward. But I, I'll take two chairs, and I'll stand on one of the chairs. And I'll say, this is my hope fully set on the grace to be revealed. What grace to be? I thought I already received grace. I was forgiven of my sin. Yeah, you have, spiritually, but what's the grace to be revealed when Jesus is revealed? I get a new body. See, when Jesus comes back, I'm going to get a new body that'll never die, that'll never grow old, that'll never have disease, and any tears I'll have, he'll wipe away and I won't cry anymore. And I'm going to go to a place where there's no sickness, no death, no suffering, no sorrow, no misery. All the things that people think God should give here and now on this earth, he is going to give then. And it's going to be a perfect place. I'm not even going to be tempted there. That's the thing I'm looking forward to the most, is I won't ever go, am I doing the right thing? Because I'm not going to be tempted to do the wrong. I'll just, everything I do will be right for once. And that's my hope. That's what I'm... Set your, set your hope fully on that. See, then I have the other chair, and I said, this chair over here is your spouse or your kids or your job or your money or your health. And if you try to live in both worlds, you try to be duplistic, I'm going to put my hope in eternity, but also in my wife. What are you going to do when she cheats on you and leaves you? And you're raising three kids by yourself. I'm going to put it on, on this, but also on my health. What are you going to do when they find the tumor? I'm going to put it on this, but also on money. What are you going to do when you lose your job? You don't have income. If you try to live in both worlds, you try to love God and the world, it's impossible. Because all the devil has to do to make you fall over. If you got one foot on one chair and one foot on the other chair, how many of the chairs does the, the devil have to remove for you to fall over? Just one. Now, he can't take away the hope of eternal life promised in Christ, but he can take away your spouse. He can take away your health, like he did Job. He can take away your kids. And if you put your hope on those things, down you go. You have to set your hope fully on the grace to be revealed. And that's what Job was saying. I'm going to die, and the, he literally says there, the maggots will eat my body. But yet in my body, after that, after the resurrection, I will see God. He believed in resurrection from the dead. 
the very first book, we're seeing the hope of eternal life is that anchor for the soul of hope that keeps you anchored and right in your mindset. You want to calibrate your life? You want to get yourself in the right mind? Number one thing you need to be praying for is your spiritual life, that you set your hope fully. You know, there's things that are promised and there's things that are not promised. I'm not promised a, a new f Ferrari, right? <laughs> Lord, give me a new Ferrari, preferably red. Uh, he's probably not going to answer that prayer. Um, I always use that as an illustration. I always thought it'd be funny if God someday gave me a Ferrari. But anyway, um, I'm probably never going to get a Ferrari. But, what, but things, there are things I can pray for that he does promise and he does guarantee that I can count on. That I pray for the forgiveness of sins. As a Christian, he'll give it. If I pray for him to give me opportunity to do his will, he will. If I pray for my needs to be met, he will. If I pray for my daily bread, he'll give it. If I pray for, you know, um, the, the growth in my, my character, he'll help me do it. If I pray for victory over a, an addiction or a temptation, he'll, he'll show the way. There are some things I can pray for that I can get because it's God's will. And we need to be focused on forever. Early in the morning, he would sacrifice a burnt offering for each of them, thinking, perhaps my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. This was Job's regular custom. He was constantly calibrating on eternal things. How did he handle losing everything except his wife in a day? And notice the devil didn't take his wife. He left her there to nag him. Go ahead, curse God and die. Thanks a lot, Lord. <laughs> she couldn't have been over there with the kids. Uh, uh, the, uh, the, um, he was calibrated on eternal things. How is it he could handle and say, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away, blessed be the name of the Lord? Because he knew he wasn't keeping it anyway. He came into the world naked, he was going to leave the world naked. Can't take it with you. And the only thing that mattered was eternal things. And as he laid his head down in dust and sackcloth with tear-stained eyes that night, he was heartbreak, missing his children and hurting over his loss. One thing he didn't have to worry about. Were my kids' sins atoned for? Were my kids spiritually right with God? That's one thing he didn't have to worry about. And I'd say that's the most important thing. So, sorry Jimmy, I think God's still a good father. Because we've sinned, we've done wrong, we cursed this world, we messed it up, and God sent his only begotten son so that we could all be forgiven. And gave his son as an atoning sacrifice so that we can escape the place that we destroyed. Yeah, God's a good father. Yes, he is. And he answers prayer. He doesn't give us every little temporary earthly thing we want because sometimes he knows better. But the big things, the important things, the eternal things, yeah, he's a good, good father. And there's power and importance and virtue in prayer. 3 John 1, 2 through 4. Dear friend, I pray that you may enjoy good health, and that it all would go well with you, even as your soul is getting along well. It gave me great joy to have some brothers come and tell about your faithfulness to the truth and how you continue to walk in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Madison married a, a good man. I've got a beautiful little uh, grandson. Very happy for her. I hope that Drake and Kaylee are able to find godly, good spouses. And I, you know, I want good things for my kids. But nothing brings me greater joy than to know they're in God. They're serving God. They love God. They believe the truth and they're holding to the truth. There's no greater joy. Yeah, we pray for them to have good health and that things go well and that their physical things go as good as the spiritual things are going. But the real joy comes from knowing they're spiritually right 
with God. I know no greater joy than to know that my children love God and are following God. And I could think of no greater horrible thing for me than if they didn't. Um, there are times in my life when I was ready to go to heaven and be with God. I was tired of this world. But you know what kept me motivated sometimes? I'm ashamed to say, Madison, Drake, and Kaylee. I wanted to influence them to walk with God. Period. I mean, that was it. I was down to that. Because those are the important things. The greatest joy. You see, sometimes we calibrate our lives through that prayer, through that seeking of God. How did Job handle losing everything? Because we see in chapter 1, previous to his hard times, he had calibrated. And during his hard times, he calibrated. And then when he talked to God and God answered him, he prayed and then he meditated on what God said to him. He said, I thought about it. I spoke once, I spoke twice. The third time I realized I better shut up. He put his hand over his mouth. He said, I spoke of things too wonderful for me to know. Talking to God, then thinking about God and who he is and what he's done, calibrated him. What did God say to him? I've done this, I've done that. Do you understand this? Do you know that? Do you understand this? He, he saw who God was. He meditated and thought about who God was. And boom, he was calibrated. Sorry, God. I trust you. And nothing calibrates you. Like through prayer, Bible study, meditation on God and his person, going into his presence, focusing on him. It'll calibrate you. It'll set you straight. Sometimes it's painful. But it's worth it. Sometimes it hurts. Sometimes there's tears. But it's worth it. And it's for your good. So I want to encourage you, as we study this, realize, hey, this is important stuff to me. This is going to calibrate my life. Okay? All right, we are going to take a 10-minute break and at exactly uh, 11, uh, we will start back up, all right? So let's take a 10-minute break, and then we'll start again.